We are now going to hear from Dr. Juliet Burke. This is one of my my favourites. I was looking forward to this session, um, looking through the agenda. Now, Dr. Juliet, Juliet Burke is uh, no stranger to us. We came across her her work and her as an expert in this field when we ran the um, higher education diversity clinics and seminars and conferences this year across Australia. So Dr. Dr. Juliet Burke is a professor of practice in the School of Management and Governance at the Business School at the University of New South Wales, formerly a human capital partner at Deloitte, leading the diversity and inclusion practice. Juliet now works in global organisations to transform their workplace culture so they're more inclusive of diversity. In particular, she assesses the develop and develops leaders' inclusive leadership capabilities and guides the development of organisational DEI strategies. Her research on inclusive leadership, diversity of thinking and inter interpersonal inclusion is well known, as I mentioned, regular articles in the Harvard Business Review, terrific talk in TEDx, her most recent book released in 2021 entitled Which Two Heads Are Better Than One? The Extraordinary Power of Diversity of Thinking and Inclusive Leadership. Juliet sits on a number of boards, including the Global Institute for Women's Leadership and QChange, which is a US-based HR tech startup. The depth of Juliet's capabilities and her contributions to organizational effectiveness and public policy reform have been recognized through her receipt of awards such as Engage Lee's Top 100 Global HR Influencer in 2021 and 22, and the Australian Financial Review Top 100 Women of Influence in, and Deloitte's Chairman Global excuse me, and the Deloitte Chairman's Global Recognition Award in 2019. It's such a long, impressive bio, almost choked. In 2022, she completed her PhD and was awarded the Dean's Prize for Innovation and Impact. The title of Juliet's talk is Co-Creating Inclusive Teams, Shining a Light on Interpersonal Inclusion Between Colleagues. And she'll talk about three small behaviours of interpersonal inclusion and a link between those behaviours and individual job performance as well as team effectiveness. Welcome, Juliet. Thank you. I know that was a bit long-winded, wasn't it, Carl? I'm sorry to put you through that, going through the whole bio, but oh, fortunately, you completely choke. Yeah. No, that was a great, um, that was a bit of exercise for, for midday. It was, and look, it is very impressive. And as I said, this isn't the first time that your name's come across our desk at the Culture Institute. We're, we're really impressed and and um, with the work that you do, we think it's really worthwhile and the, the more the better, you know, certainly in the pockets that we consult to in the large end of town and uh, in higher education, there's certainly not enough being done in this space. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say today. Great. Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here and thanks so much to Matt Manners for inviting me. You'll see a slight uh, title change that I've got here on my slides, but it's it's actually the same content. It's just, you know, when you're developing something, you redevelop it and you think of new names. This is the research that was based on my PhD. So I only got 20 minutes with you, so let me dive straight into it. What I thought I would do is talk to you about three things. First, some background, you know, why have I been thinking about interpersonal inclusion? Where does that sit within the context of inclusion work? three specific behaviours that create an experience of interpersonal inclusion, and then making sure that I bring it back to diversity because our objective ultimately is the inclusion of diversity, not in more inclusion of same. So let me just um, position this background here. Um, and there, there is an article in HBR that I wrote in 2021 on this if you want to find some more information. But... This is how I think about things. What organisations, and I and I count myself in that as well in terms of as an organisational practitioner, what organisations have done in their approach to creating an environment of inclusion is, and first of all, to design organisational policies and programs. So you might think about um, statements of intent around we want to be an inclusive organisation or flexible work practices or anti-discrimination policies uh, or programs around, you know, uh, let's not harass people kind of programs. That, that is an important part of creating the infrastructure, the environment in which inclusion can flourish. It's not, obviously not the only thing to do, but it is an important background context. And that is what a lot of organisations started with and continue to do. 
A second, more recent uh, approach to creating an inclusive workplace, and these are complementary, these are additional, is to focus on leadership. And some of you might have read some of that work that um, I've written on inclusive leadership and the six signature traits of inclusive leadership. And you might think about this as if, if the organisation or approach is the infrastructure, this is the vertical, focusing on leaders' impacts within that culture, trying to create an inclusive place. Obviously really important. I think it's really important too. But I think the thing that we all kind of missed was there's a complementary focus we could have had on looking at team members. That is, what do the very many people who are team members who don't really perceive themselves as leaders within the organisation, what role do they have in creating an inclusive environment around them? And that focus has been missing in academic literature and it's probably been missing in practice as well. So what we generally see in the approach to developing an inclusive organisation is let's focus on creating the infrastructure and let's uh, assess and develop leaders' capabilities. And those things are, those two things are very important, but this is a third. And you can see I've written down the bottom of the slide here, the reference to the HBR article. So if that's right or seems about right, I guess the question is, is it really right? You know, do, should we be focusing on uh, interpersonal inclusion at that peer level? So a question for me when I was doing the research was, well, it sounds a bit logical to be focused on that. So why wouldn't people have looked at that level before? And one of the reasons for that is actually just the way that we've conceptualised inclusion. That is, that it really is you've got an individual here and you've got the group over here, the bigger group, and it, the group is the only one who has the power to include the individual, to bring that person in. That, that's sort of the construct sitting behind it. So it's either the group itself or the leader of the group that has the power to include an individual. And I guess with my um, PhD, I was thinking, well, is that really right? You know, could it be, we haven't talked about peer level inclusion, but could peers have the power to include each other? So even if you're an equal, you have the power to include an individual. Um, if you've got any questions about this, please put them into the chat and I will answer them as I go. So I guess the first finding from the PhD is that interpersonal inclusion is real in the sense that um, when I spoke to people about their peer relationships, they said, I have the power to include another person who is at the same level as me. So you, whereas if you think about uh inclusive leadership as a vertical, this is the horizontal. So that is a real thing. And you can see the way that I've tried to visualise it here is that all of those people are peers and one person can hook the other person into an individual relationship and that individual relationship is probably going to be part of the bigger group. So the first thing is that inclusion is real at that peer-based level, i.e. I have the power to include someone who's an equal and they have the power to include me. And when we talk about inclusion in that way, the language that people use is that the person made me feel valued, I feel, feel felt connected to them. We don't tend to use the language of belonging so much in that peer level, you don't belong to me and I don't belong to you. So it's a slightly different experience than being part of a group. But inclusion is still an experience that we have at that one-on-one. -on -one. So if that's right, what it does is it opens up a new frontier that it, as organisational practitioners, we might say we have a new way of influencing culture which complements existing ways. The challenge, of course, is what exactly does interpersonal inclusion mean? I.e., what are the small behaviours that comprise this experience of feeling included? What do I do? What don't I do? You know, what do I overlook? So then I did two studies for the PhD. One was interview-based and the other one was observing a, um, a team over a period of two months, literally sitting and watching their weekly team meetings and talking to them about that and identified from that 
three discrete behaviours that people do. The first behaviour I would categorise as instrumental assistance. So what that means is that I do something for you or you do something for me, which helps me with my day job. Let me just get my notes out here. I want to make sure that I give you all of the elements of instrumental assistance. So, um, of course, we have requirements as peers to work with that other person and to, to behave in a collegiate way, but this is sort of going above and beyond. If I do things for you that are not really part of my job, for example, we're in a meeting together and I meet someone and I think oh, it'd be great if Matt knew this person as well, and first thing I do after the meeting is I ping Matt and say, Matt, got a great contact for you. I am providing him with assistance to do his job because that contact could help him. If I provide him with information that I learned in that meeting, um, if I appreciate something that he has done, I, I might endorse what he says in a meeting. Oh, you know, as Carl said, right, I'm giving my voice behind his voice that gives his voice more weight. Those things, or, or, or even giving him advice, um, those things help him to do his job. And it, it's not just the assistance, it also creates this feeling between us that um, I am a valuable person, he feels he's a valuable person and we feel a sense of connection and we call that inclusion. So that's the first category of things that people do. The second category of things that people do are behaviours that are designed to create emotional bond. And what we mean by emotional bond or what I mean by emotional bond is those behaviours which once again are discretionary, going above and beyond, but they really create a human connection between two people. I invite you to go and have a coffee. My style is warm and empathetic. I allow you to vent in front of me. I show interest in your personal interests. And that creates this feeling of inclusion between us. And then the last thing is what I would call embodied connection. And the emphasis here is on the word embodied, i.e. we use our bodies to create connection with other people. And we do that through our nonverbal skills. Um, you know, if we're smiling in a meeting with someone, we're nodding our head, the way that we shake our hands. If we're in a physical environment, we might say, hey, let's go and walk to the meeting together. If we're in a Zoom environment, the degree to which we show our backgrounds creates that sort of surround sound. But those things, we use our body to create a sense of value and connection with the other person. So, those three things, you know, are the categories of behaviour, but really what I wanted to emphasise here is the relationship to diversity. And this, let me deconstruct this graph for you. What this shows is those small acts of inclusion are not distributed equally amongst team members in the group. So if you're looking at the coding here, what you can see with the black is people who identified themselves as dominantly similar to the group. And when we say dominantly similar, it's how the person defines dominantly similar. So it might be we're from the same technical area or we um, live in the same geography or we both have kids. Whatever is important to me and I identify, yes, there's more of those kind of people in the group. So those people who are dominantly similar to me. And dominantly different is the grey graph, grey circle. So what you can see here, if you look at the top of the screen where you've got 100% inclusion, people who are dominantly different and dominantly similar experience the same levels of interpersonal inclusion, i.e. they get the same amount of those little behaviours. But in relation to interpersonal exclusion, those people who are dominantly different get more experiences of exclusion as well. And the exclusion that I saw in my study was not overt. It was more the absence of extra love and attention. So what that looked like is they would get acts of endorsement, right? They do get acts, that's the above the line, but they get three times fewer endorsements. So they do get information coming out of a meeting. Someone will call them, hey, Juliet, I just heard something, 
but using myself as the example, I'm three times less likely to receive that information. So I do get a bit of it. So what this tells us is that people, everyone experiences interpersonal inclusion and exclusion, but people who are more different to the team experience more acts of exclusion and they are usually in the nature of not receiving these small behaviours that give them advantage or less, less of those small behaviours. Let me just check if that makes abundant sense because we're rushing through this very quickly and I want to make sure this slide lands with you. Thanks, Carl. Anyone else? Do you need me to sort of... So the two dominant things from here, everyone experiences small acts of inclusion, everyone experiences small acts of exclusion, but those people who identify themselves as different to the team receive fewer. And that matters because when you experience these examples of interpersonal inclusion, it helps you to do your job. Right? Because every time you get that extra bit of information or deepen the relationship with someone or feel this sense of connection, this embodied connection, it is drawing you closer to them. It's like you are greasing the wheels to make the relationship work. So your individual performance increases when you receive these small acts of inclusion and because then your human capital increases, actually the human capital of the team. So what does this mean? So what in the end of all of this? What this means, I think, is three things. Firstly, we have the opportunity to broaden the conversation from let's not just talk about the organisational infrastructure and inclusive leadership, but let's also talk about the way that team members themselves can co-create an experience of inclusion. It's not just down to the organisation and it's not just down to leaders. Individuals make a material difference to the experience of the person sitting right next to them. The second point I would make is that we probably need to do a bit of a self-audit and seek some feedback on our behaviours because most of the time when I saw people doing these non-behaviours of interpersonal inclusion, they just didn't know it. They thought, yeah, yeah, I, I endorse Carl. But when I looked at it, what I could see, yes, they endorsed Carl, but three times less frequently than they endorsed Matt. And that created a disparate relation relationship between. So people don't often know that they're doing something in with less frequency to a person who's different to them. And the last thing is actually it's, it's an important part of empowerment because if we let people know within the team that interpersonal inclusion is real, we can also let them know you don't have to be passive and just wait for someone to do that behaviour to you. If you behave in a way to them, which is instrumental assistant, you give them information or you ask them to go for a walk, not every time, it's not always going to work, but... Generally what happens is you kickstart a process because it's almost like an irresistible urge to do reciprocity. When someone shares information with you, you feel I will share information back with them. So actually this is a very empowering message for people who perceive themselves as different to other people and receiving less, fewer acts of interpersonal inclusion. You can actually not... You don't have to wait for someone to do it to you. You can um, kickstart the ball, make the ball start rolling by you leaning in and giving those in acts of interpersonal inclusion to other people. All right, so uh, that's it from me. I know we've only got um, oh, there's, uh, one question. Is that right, Carl? Uh, actually, I've got a couple of questions for you. That's um, that's incredibly interesting. Uh, the questions are relatively deep, so um, and I, you probably appreciate that given who you are and what you do. The um, the, the first one, I suppose, and look, they're, they're very sensitive questions because we, we're talking about you know minority groups in some instances and those people who feel alienated and excluded. The, the idea of unconscious bias, and you mentioned before there that a lot of people aren't aware that they're not providing the same level of or volume or saturation of cues of belonging or inclusion. 
Mm. Why is that? Like, what, what's what's driving the limitation? First of all, I think that part of the limitation is they don't even identify what it is that they're doing. As soon as, you, as soon as I say those things, those three things, we can all go, oh, that was the answer. I mean, it did take me three years to find that out. But, you know, um, they're very basic things. And I don't think we are actually thinking about it in that way. So we didn't really have a taxonomy to say, when I say this word interpersonal inclusion, I mean, I'm sure there's something to it, but what is it that I'm doing? So now we know it, then we can stand back and say, yeah, you're probably right. When I think about endorsements, who do I constantly say, yeah, that was a great idea, and who do I just overlook? So I think part of it was just didn't really know exactly what personal inclusion was. And I think probably the second thing is that we don't really have strong feedback loops around us for people to say, hey, did you realise, like, you always give Juliet an endorsement and you seem to overlook that person over there. So I'm going to go with an optimistic frame, which was just it was about awareness and now yeah. we know these things and can put in place processes um, because it's unconscious bias rather than conscious bias. Okay. I'm going to darken the frame a little bit. So you talked about reciprocity before and Caldini's work around the art of influence talks about reciprocity. He also talks about the principles of liking that we generally like people who are more like us. So mm. my question to you is, are we trying to decode the human condition in this process? I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to recognise that we may not like everyone in the team, but we have to work with them and we want our team's performance we want high team performance and also we want high individual and performance. So I may not like you, Carl. I'm sure I do. But I'm, I may not like you, but you're still my peer. I still need to have a strong working relationship with you. We may not be best friends, but we need to have a relationship in which there is a good exchange. So I think it's separating out liking for just you're my team member. Let's work mm. on it. I think it's also worthwhile, just that education component in the executive teams I work with in, in culture, just the points that you've made there, just for them to become aware that we do have a preference in certain instances, you know, be it scientific or be it a social construct, to endorse one another over one another and then to remain open to challenging that and just reshaping our, our preference. I think that goes a long way because, to your point, we did a, a piece of research around self-awareness and authentic leadership and there's a massive over-index in self-perception of self-awareness. So people will think, oh, I'm very self-aware, but when we actually ran the diagnostic, 15% of that, well, those people actually passed the self-awareness metric. So I think that information is critical for, you know, all leaders and teams to understand before they engage with it. I think that's true. I, I've done a lot of work around inclusive leadership assessment and development work, and I, I found the same kind of thing. Only 30% of people were able to accurately see themselves as other people saw them um, because they really didn't have a good intuitive sense of it and they didn't have a feedback loop going. 30% overrated their capabilities and actually 30% underrated their capabilities. They were, wow. in fact, more inclusive than they gave themselves credit for. So it was almost like they were hiding a light under a bushel. They weren't they didn't know they were good at it and therefore they weren't teaching others. You know, they weren't leaning into that role as of coach because they thought, oh, I'm not that good. So, but I agree with you, you know, most of us, most of us um, don't really have a good sense of self. No, fascinating. Thanks so much for your, your time and expertise and for sharing that with us today. You don't know it, but I'll be looking up after this for our own podcast and a couple of other things we've got coming up. So I'd love to continue right. the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.